Of the myriad of animals to come through the anomalies in Primeval, the future predator was the most frequent threat. Whether a mated pair searching for a new roost, or with the experimentation at the hands of various human organisations, they are effectively the flagship of the series. And as a giant, flightless, carnivorous bat from millennia in the future, they're a pretty solid creature. We only get tidbits of their actual ecology and behaviour across the episodes, so we'll use that and mix it with their ancient relatives, the bats of today, and some other assorted animals, to try and piece together some theories on how they may live, as well as their nature of spec evo in general. To get the ball rolling, one thing that's worth noting is how unclear a lot of the presented behaviour around future predators is. There aren't exactly great sample sizes for the instances of behaviour or ecology shown. So even by spec evo standards, this video will be quite speculative. The mated pair in the first season turned out to be somewhat anomalous themselves, with a chronologically feral population living in a ruined city, in a social group of what seemed to be between 5 and 10 adults and an unknown number of pups. It does seem then that their natural way of life is relatively social. The large number leak captured in the second season, whilst somewhat alarmed when their consciousness returned, showed next to no hostility to one another afterwards. So maybe the pair in the first season were two dispersals that had bonded, mated, and were in the process of setting up a new colony. The process of breeding and offspring provisioning may be like that of the large and predatory spectral bats. In this species, one of the adults stays with the offspring while the other forages. In one captive couple, the male brought back food to his mate and pup at their roost. This seems effectively similar, albeit swapped, to what we see the mated pair do in the first season. The male stays close to the nest to guard the offspring, whilst the female provisions the family with food in a nearby larder. It could also be the couple take it in turns to forage and stay with the offspring respectively, and the male was just killed on his round of babysitting. The development of future predators is also something of a mystery. It's unknown how large predator pups get before they're weaned. It could be possible that the cat-sized pups at this stage of development were weaned, considering the mother spent reasonably long periods of time away from them. But at this point the family had only been in the present for a day or so, so it seems either that the future predators have either a very brief nursing period, or very rich milk to sustain young for long periods of time in their mother's absence. It's also possible pups may be born able to eat some solid food already to help tide them over in absences. Ultra-rich milk is typically seen in polar animals, or aquatic ones, but also the spotted hyena. This is likely an adaptation due to migratory prey, often making up a large portion of hyena diet. The mothers have to travel long distances to follow reliable food, and the cubs can go for days without a feed due to the huge amounts of fats and proteins in the milk. If we assume the predators live in a dense forest environment, and more on that in a bit, then this adaptation would actually make a lot of sense. We think of rainforests as the ultimate in biodiversity and habitat richness, but if you're a large mammal, they're not easy places to live. Most of the good edible food is in the canopy, and even then this isn't as reliable a source of food as you may think. Fruit and flower production in Southeast Asian rainforests isn't regular. It can often be a sudden boom of abundance, followed by multiple years of very low production. When a massed year of good production occurs, it can be a single river valley or the entire region. It can be a certain species of tree or all of them. And the conditions behind masting are still unknown. It can't be stressed enough what an irregular resource this is. And as you'd expect, this has a significant impact on the animals in that area. Frugivorous animals like sun bears, orangutans, and bearded pigs will exclusively eat masting fruit species in periods of glut and undergo severe losses of condition and even mortality via starvation in the lean periods between them. And it isn't just them. The mash trees can become hives of activities for multiple species in this time period. For an arboreal predator, this sudden rush of potential prey is as much a boom period as the fruit is for the herbivores. And in the lean periods, the resources will become far more scattered across the landscape, as well as just lower in density too as starvation takes its toll. If the natural environment of the future predators is anything like this, they may have two resource peaks. One of the animals congregating for fruit, and one at the end of the mast period, when large numbers of animals will become weak and easier prey. 
They may even prey switch to larger or tougher species they can't bring down when healthy. Hyper-rich milk may be an adaptation to the irregular scattering of resources across their territory, and the long distances mother predators may have to go to acquire the food. For future predators being arboreal, this just seems very likely with everything we see from them. They're very agile and dexterous. They're very at home leaping on and between buildings, and they just generally seem to prefer moving and resting in higher places. This allows us to infer things about their environment and where they do and don't belong. Their hairless body also seems to suggest they come from a warm environment, so it's not likely to be comparable to a montane rainforest either. So the combination of arboreal nature and hairlessness does seem to suggest a warm, tropical, low-lying rainforest as the most likely natural home for them. In Season 4, we see future predators in an arid desert landscape, but they really can't be said to be thriving here. Their movements seem off, and they're covered in lesions. This possibly social species shows nothing but hostility towards one another to the point of intraspecific killing. Like the group living in the ruined city, these are probably ones trapped in another time period due to the anomalies, and one that really didn't suit them. Their extreme hostility and poor condition are likely brought on out of desperation, and it's possible they may even be doomed to extinction before too long. The group living in the ruined city is interesting, as it seems their residency coincided with the end of humanity. It's a bit much to think the predators literally killed off all the humans, but it does seem quite possible they may have done so via disease transmission. Bats can often be immune to diseases lethal in humans, and the humans were getting pretty up close and personal with the predators in poorly controlled settings. It's never said what exactly Christine Johnson wanted with the future predators, but among other things, in trying to find a cure for COVID-19 or something similar, they instead unleashed COVID-37,428, which proceeded to red queen the human immune system and wipe us out. Another interesting point the offspring give us is that they have very large litter sizes for bats. Many bats will often have just a single pup, but some can have up to four, although that's quite rare. The median is often three for a politicus species that can have multiple young. But what cost and benefits does this bring? And how did it benefit or influence the future predators? The main cost of this, for bats as we know them at least, is that it shortens lifespan. It's believed this is due to parental care using up resources due to the larger litter, Child rearing is energetically expensive, especially for bats, and having more than one really takes its toll. With higher turnover rates, more offspring, and shorter gestation, Politicus bats have a higher evolutionary rate than others, too. Becoming a top order carnivore isn't easy, and considering the evolutionary uphill struggle Coropterans would have against mammalian carnivores, or if they weren't present, other already terrestrial mammals. Politici could make the evolutionary difference in allowing them to carve out new niches quicker than other bats and other animals. It may also be that it allows them to use other roosting sites. Whilst many bats prefer caves or analogous structures, Politicus bats can roost in foliage. This isn't as secure as something like a cave, and it's possible they may manage this better due to having more than one pup. They can afford a riskier, poorer quality roost site because they have a few extra kids on backup. They'll make it to adulthood and continue the colony, even if a few get eaten or fall. And again, this could be a critical trait in allowing the ancestors of the future predators into their niche. This allows a broader range of habitats to be exploited, so there's more chance of getting your foot in the door when a new niche opens up. It's worth noting, due to the huge difference between future predators and today's bats, they may not have the same influences or selective pressures regarding litter size and several traits that allowed them to become the animals they are may have since been reversed or abandoned, but the origins of this trait could have been a key factor in their successful rise to predators. The feral population living in the ruins seems to have a relatively small number of young for the amount of adults. Whilst it's possible there could be more offspring unseen, if we assume an even sex ratio in the group, it seems unlikely that in a generation, 10 future predators would become 60 and the ecosystem could support this. There are two possible explanations. One that, as just discussed, future predators have larger litter sizes to allow for higher infant mortality due to more dangerous nest sites. 
Or maybe more likely that future predators are cooperative breeders. This is a term in behavioural ecology that refers to a broad spectrum of social systems characterised by receiving care from other group members and not just your parents. This is something some bats do, and in one paper it was suggested that this is only really a viable action in small groups. This is still multiple births in a single group, which as said seems unlikely for the predators, but cooperative breeding also refers to social systems like canids, where they're nuclear families the dominant pair of the parents and the other adults of their offspring who help rear future litters. It can also occur that siblings stick together and will help their brothers and sisters with raising their offspring. This is known as inclusive fitness, the notion that due to your very close genetic similarity to your siblings, their offspring will almost be equivalent to your own, and helping to rear them is still a measure of evolutionary success. This allows for a good fallback, as creating your own family is difficult, you have to find a mate, and then find your own territory, and then defend it. All of that is pretty risky business, so it can often just be simpler to help a sibling rear their own kids, which have a quarter of your DNA anyway. In bats, it's believed there are three causes for sociality. Thermoregulation, limited roost availability, and longevity. If limited roost availability is also a cause for concern among future predators, then this may be an evolutionary prompt for cooperative breeding too. Why go out and begin the risky process of setting up your own colony alone, when you can help a sibling rear their own offspring and get to stay in the reliable safety of the territory you already know, with a solid and existing roost? As it does seem future predators may be picky with maternity roosts at least, selecting cave-like analogues such as human buildings for them, there will be a premium on this sort of structure, and this just adds another layer of difficulty in starting your own colony. Which isn't to say it doesn't just happen, of course, or future predators would never disperse, more just that this is an argument for them being cooperative breeders. Another interpretation of these group sizes could be fish and fusion sociality. This is effectively the nature of why animals form groups, split into smaller groups, or split into single individuals again. In greater noctual bats, large maternal colonies do this, with the females from the greater colony frequently switching between various roosts and the other colony members in them. It's believed this constant cycling of roosts and group members allows the overall colony to remain a single unit by maintaining the larger number of social bonds. It's also useful to exchange information about roosts, if you found a new one or if an old one is no longer viable as after all, a good roost is a serious resource for bats. So maybe the group sizes of future predators are just individual roosts in a larger colony. With such large carnivores, they're probably not living in a hundred plus groups, but it could be something like 30 or 40 adults spread over a large area between four or five roosts, with non-breeding adults constantly swapping between the roosts. Unlike noctules, future predators probably can't transport their young to new roosts, and so likely remain in one place until they're old enough to travel by themselves. Information transfer and fish and fusion behaviours may not just be limited to roosts, and future predators may also use it to exchange or coordinate information related to foraging too. Bats are often attracted to each other feeding, and it's also suggested that they may use certain calls to gather conspecifics at an area. This may help search and track prey for bats in groups looking for mixed resources, and these behaviours aren't just limited to bats, they translate well for large carnivores too. Spotted hyenas also use fish and fusion in their foraging, and it allows them to better search larger areas for prey by splitting up. Once a kill is made, they can call in others, or are found by them anyway. Or if lions are found on a kill, or other hyenas are intruding in their territory, reinforcements can be called in to confront them. This may be how groups of future predators forage, splitting off into individual units to find prey. If a large prey item is too big for a single one, or if a rival colony is found, the predators can work as a team to bring it down or repel the opposition. Once kills have been made though, future predators may still support each other. Vampire bats engage in reciprocal altruism, where successful individuals donate blood to unsuccessful ones after a night's forage, and in turn the unsuccessful ones return the favour when they have a good night. Future predators do bring kills back to the dens when breeding at least, so it could be possible that their colonies have some form of reciprocal altruism with the sharing of food. But how do the future predators acquire their food on the hunt? 
and what are they eating? For a start, I don't think the future predator is a macro predator, which is to say something that kills things significantly larger than its own body mass. Single future predators seem wary of other large animals, like the other members of Leek's menagerie, and when a defensive mother predator attacks a Gorgonopsid, she gets punted into oblivion in round one, and then fares even worse in round two. While she does manage to poke its eye out, she doesn't deliver anything more than superficial scratches before getting crushed. To take down Primeval's Mega Gorgonopsid is a big ask, even if you're not smaller than one. But when we look at the design, the future predators don't really seem built to take on large things. Their teeth are thin and none seem especially robust. They can and do deliver powerful strikes with the forelimbs, but they rarely seem to kill this way. Overall, I think the future predators are built to use speed, agility, and dexterity to kill things similar in size to their own mass, or smaller. From what we see, future predators do still seem to go for the throat, but they may have a unique method of killing. With short, sharp teeth, they don't seem well suited to deep bites or suffocation, so it seems they may attack soft areas with important blood vessels to cause death via blood loss, almost like a mix of canid and felid, anchoring themselves to an opponent and fastening themselves to the throat with their dexterous forelimbs like a cat typically does, but actually killing by tearing open the prey like a dog typically does. In the event of groups coming across a large prey item, it may just be swarmed by the predators as they each cling on and gnaw away at a soft section of tissue like the throat or underbelly. This is, of course, speculative, but it's not too dissimilar from some of today's predatory bats. Some of the largest and most impressive, the ghost bats, anchor themselves to a prey item with their thumb claws and kill it with a piercing bite to the skull or throat, much like a small felid. The animals of the future may have niches or aspects of their morphology that aren't directly analogous to the animals of today. It's suggested the animals of the past may have been the same. The marsupial lion is suggested to have anchored itself to its prey with its teeth, and then killed them with its powerful and dexterous thumb claw. With making animals in speculative evolution, it's pretty much open season as to their niches and design, so long as you at least do some homework as to back up the wackier aspects of their design. Giant predatory bats, or bat-like animals, be they volant or flightless, are a staple of Spec Evo, and swiftly becoming part of a clade of fictional animals often used to show off the weirdness of lost worlds, taking something we know and altering it in a bizarre or threatening fashion, realistically grounding the fantasy of such places. But for their frequency in our ideas of the future, could bats ever attain this lofty role of top-order carnivores? It doesn't seem likely, unfortunately. There is already fierce competition in this niche, Mustelids and viverids already do a fine job of being small prey hunters, and so do foxes and small felids. Bats somehow have to get past all of them first, and they're not going extinct by themselves. So long as there's food, they'll almost certainly survive. So to get rid of extant small carnivores, you also need to get rid of rodents. Which is difficult for one thing, and also wiping out the initial food source for the start of your future predatory bats for another. It's unknown how large bats can get and still remain nocturnal predators on the wing, too. Bats as they stand are pretty often killed by predatory birds. There are some, like bat hawks, literally specialising in this. Trying to remain aerial until a certain size but being diurnal is an even worse idea, with studies showing bats are effectively living on borrowed time if they do this. Predation may not just be a reason for bats to stay nocturnal, it's been suggested this is also the reason they became nocturnal in the first place. In short, there's a lot riding against the idea of giant predatory future bats. But really, I think many would be surprised how boring Spec Evo would be if we made it purely realistic. Chances are you're going to have to go very far into the future to get rid of the current cast of tough generalists, because they're just that good at what they do. They didn't get here by walking into the wrong room at the audition, it took millennia of evolutionary trial and error for them to be the best fit for the role. With their huge ranges and tolerance to assorted environmental conditions, they're going nowhere fast. So even millennia into the future, you might still be quite bored by what you see versus what you expect. Whilst it's sometimes popular in Spec Evo to drag others for their lack of accuracy or evolutionary sense, it's not really good or bad. Well, there's some bad, obviously. But it's much more a sliding scale and a matter of personal choice as to how accurate you are. 
After all, Dougal Dixon is often rightly praised as the founding father of Spec Evo. And my god, have you seen half these designs? With brachiating felids and theropod baboons and why all the Night Stalkers doing a handstand? There's a hell of a lot of questionable stuff in here. And whilst Dixon comes up with some pretty interesting ideas, like predatory baboons or bats, he often executes them in the weirdest way possible, and I really can't help but feel he was being weird for the sake of it to generate more discussion about the book, as a lot of these just really make absolutely no sense. But then, if the Founding Father himself is praised for designs so out there it makes Monster Hunter look restrained, then really it's a case of doing what you like. As I said, it's more a sliding scale of realism that's up to you with how closely you want to stick to it. Spec Evo animals aren't real, they're created for fun. They exist in environments that typically require our extinction to develop. They're just beings of our imagination that you can do what you want with, really. As with anything, there are always going to be some pretty tiresome or overdone tropes. The desire for a lot of people to have the mega super apex predator that weighs 20 tons and has 8 different ways of killing its prey in the most energetically expensive way possible, essentially the cold steel the hedgehog spec evo creature, was never going to be a world beater. The notion that mammals are somehow weak and flimsy I've always found a bit wet too. Good as the future as wild was, its notion that the weak little mammals were replaced with invertebrates and squid isn't especially well founded in the mammal and mammal-like ability to survive mass extinctions. One thing I also personally think is a bit annoying is shoehorning various animals into different niches and then having it be identical to the animal in the original niche. The legendary Esquilax, a horse with the head of a rabbit and the body of a rabbit. But despite my occasional gripes with the genre, some Spec Evo projects are genuinely incredible. Serena is an amazing partnership of creativity, artwork, and biology. The best Spec Evo, of which Serena definitely is, seems to be where the world is created first and then everything is built up from there, rather than making something cool and then shoehorning it into an environment at random. At the end of the day, much of the same factors that go into making any good monster go into Spec Evo, so maybe accuracy isn't the right word for it. So much as inspiration, picking and choosing the traits that are successful across assorted habitats and taxa, and applying them to fictitious animals, or making new ideas like the marsupial lion's death thumb, but with reasonable physiological grounds. Despite being fictitious animals created for entertainment, the roots to the real world that ground them are important for allowing us to suspend our disbelief that these things could actually exist. But of course, all of this is just my thoughts on the genre, because after all that, I do still really like the future Predator. I think it's a very recognisable silhouette and one of the best monsters that wasn't produced by some Hollywood studio too. It could be a bit more realistic and bat-like though. There's a very nice piece of artwork showing the future Predator reimagined but with ears, done by Svenafine on Twitter, which is really something the future Predator conspicuously lacked to actually detect all that sound. There is also the elephant in the room of the aliens from The Quiet Place, as I don't think you can say they are just similar monsters. The aliens are literally copy and pasted future predators just with armour. I'm always impressed by the restraint shown by the writers with a creation that is their baby too. Other people would have had it just effortlessly beat the Gorgonopsid, and then probably the Columbian Mammoth too, and then constantly just be the strongest monster in the series. But instead they stay very grounded, and remain a huge threat to people but never really feel overpowered, and even become somewhat pitiable with their abuse at human hands. For Primeval itself as a show, I'd say I loved it. Well, maybe more accurate to say I loved the first two seasons, and even then I think the first is significantly better than the second. I think season one may be one of my favourite shows of any TV. The lack of organisation against the anomalies and what comes through them, as well as the freshness of the show overall, just feel great. Season 3 feels really quite weak after Cutter dies, with maybe the exception of the Forest Rocket episode. Season 4 and 5 I remember as being alright-ish, albeit a lot more campy and generally less well written as they tried to do their own story arc that just wasn't that good. But overall it was fine-ish. It could only really be so good after Cutter left anyway, as he really was its heart. Douglas Henshaw is just perfect as the good professor himself. Well when have I ever been wrong? Except about women, generally. It's nice to have a cantankerous nerd character who is actually a working scientist too, and not just some rando enthusiast. And everyone else was pretty decent too. 
The leads, though, were pretty forgettable after Cutter, but Connor remained a relatively decent character to follow. They had a great lineup of creatures, too, and whilst they were typically twice the size and three times as bloodthirsty as their real world counterparts, it's always nice to get exposure to prehistoric life outside of the Mesozoic. And with some really decent effects, too. It definitely did vary from creature to creature, but the Gorgonopsid, Predator, and Mosasaur all looked really good, especially. In the unlikely event anyone who watched this isn't familiar with Spec Evo already, Benji Thomas has a great three-part series with all the answers you could really ask for around the genre. Thanks for watching, and as ever, thank you for all the positive comments on the last video. If this is your first video of mine and you've made it this far, I normally do more stuff relating to Monster Hunter, but occasionally dabble in other forms of monster or paleo media too. So if you're interested, please do consider subscribing. Let me know what you thought of my theories, or of course if you have your own too. For some of the comments from last time, the Wolf of Comedy pointed out Pukey's habit of bullying smaller monsters may be due to its niche shift forced by Rathalos. It now has a lot more competition over a resource it never had to share before, and so became a lot more aggressive. There were also a few comments on Pukey's role and presence in the Wild Spire, Scorpiopede and Dapper Raptor pointing out that it may be the fringe of the ancient forest without Rathalos but still containing Murnos that is overall a safer home, if a less ideal one. And I think Pukey are a fringe species here, clinging to the edges of the forest on the desert. They could also potentially be brood parasites for the carnivorous Noyos, as there's records of insectivorous cuckoos being healthily fed to adulthood by both frugivores and carnivorous birds like shrikes, that in some cases fed them with whole rodents. We don't know if Palumu lays eggs, but Noah Garcia also came up with the interesting idea Pukey may parasitite Palumu in some areas too. As for Pukey's presence in Rise, I think this is best summed up by the Rise developers just not really caring about ecology or continuity. It is apparently a separate timeline after all. Hmm. Anyway, here's the teaser for next time's video.